Hi there, and welcome back to the fifth lecture on the topic of measuring stress and strain in the geodynamics course. In this lecture, we're going to look at historical strain measurements, both looking at some historical data about measuring strain, as well as some techniques that have been used in the past for strain measurements. So we have two goals in the lecture. First, we're going to look at some data from the 1906 earthquake near San Francisco. Um, that give us some sense of the deformation of the Earth associated with that earthquake. And then we'll look at the method called triangulation, which is a basic uh, calculation using trigonometry to find the location of an unknown point. And we'll talk about how that's used to measure strain on the surface of the Earth. Now, we've seen a version of this figure before, um, and it comes up in the context here of measuring strain because it's a nice example of um, about a three meter offset on a fault near where the San Francisco earthquake took place in 1906. And it clearly gives an, an indication of strain at the surface of the earth. When we have these big earthquakes, they're convenient ways of looking at things like deformation of the earth because the deformation rates and the amount of offset of faults can be quite significant on the order of meters. But typically when we're looking at measuring strain, we're looking at measuring much small, smaller displacements over shorter time scales. Um, and as a result, we require very high precision measurements if we want to make these strain measurements and then put them in the context of tectonics or geodynamics in general. So it's nice when we have the big earthquakes um, from the perspective of a geodynamicist. Of course, it's not a nice thing for society. But it's nice because we get these big offsets that allow us to measure things. But that's much, um, much more the exception than it is the rule. Much more often we're trying to make measurements in more difficult situations. So as I mentioned, here's some of the data about strain following the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. So what's shown here on the plot then is distance along the fault from northwest to southeast. So we're starting up here. Near Point Arena and moving down towards San Juan Bautista. And what's shown on the vertical axis here is the displacement, the delta W. And you'll see there's quite a bit of scatter in this data. And of course, the question comes up then, why is there so much scatter in this data? So I'd like you to pause the video for a moment. Just think about this. Think about... Um, you know, what kind of measurements might be made and maybe whether you have some ideas about why there is so much scatter in these observed strain values. So why is there so much scatter in this data? Well, it turns out the answer is this is simply the reality of strain measurements uh, in a natural setting. The earth is not a continuous homogeneous medium and these fault systems that form are going to be affected by variations in the local geology and the faults themselves may have single kind of dominant strands but may splay off onto other faults and so as a result when you look at these displacements the scatter that you observe here is just the scatter that results as part of the nat natural variability in deformation of a complicated medium like the earth's crust. All right, so let's keep going with this example for just a moment. We'll do some simple calculations and give you a chance to uh, think a little bit more about strain measurements. If we make the assumption that along this sort of long strike slip fault, that we can assume simple shear is the dominant mechanism uh, along the San Andreas Fault, and that the region that's affected is about 40 kilometers on either side of the fault, we can ask the question of what is the shear strain? So we can assume on average the displacement parallel to the fault is about two meters on either side, four meters total. Um, so in your calculation, you can use a value of two meters. And again, consider that this extends over a region about 40 kilometers on either side of the fault. I'll go ahead and let you pause the video. You may want to go back um, to look at the previous video about this calculation for the value of what the um, 
shear strain should be. I'll just give you one hint and that is that you only need to worry about shear strain with a single component. You don't have to worry about two dimensional um, shear strain. So go ahead and pause the video and uh, come back when you've got yourself a calculation. All right, let's see how you did. Hopefully you came up with something similar to this for your calculation for the shear strain and that is it's simply one half times the displacement along the x-axis divided by dz. So then in this case it would be one half times the two meter displacement divided by the 40 kilometer distance over which the um, shearing extends. And so you come away then with a shear strain of 2.5 times 10 to the minus five. And this is unitless because we have length divided by length here. We can ask another question though, and that is that if we assume that we've got great earthquakes about every 100 years, what is the shear strain rate? And this calculation's in here mainly just to give you an idea of things like shear strain rates. So uh, again, you can go ahead and calculate this. The shear strain rate is going to simply be the amount of shear that takes place per given time. I'll just give you that hint. So go ahead and do your calculation and come back when you've got yourself some numbers. All right, so as I mentioned, the shear strain rate is simply the amount of shear that takes place in a given time. In this case, it's actually kind of a simple calculation. We just take what we had before, 2.5 times 10 to the minus five, divide by 100 years, and you come away with a value for the shear strain rate of 2.5 times 10 to the minus seven per year. All right, so let's now move on to this strain measurement method called triangulation. And again, this is something that historically was done prior to the use of uh, GPS and some other more modern techniques that make life a little bit easier. The basic concept of triangulation may be something that's already familiar to you. Essentially, it involves taking measurements from point A and point B to find the location of an unknown point C. And so if you know the distance between these two points A and B, you can measure the angle between facing, for instance, point B from point A, and then turning and facing point C. So if you look at the angle here, that would be theta one. You could also then go to point B and look at the angle between facing point A and point C, and you'll find an angle of theta two. So the concept is relatively simple. What we want to do is find the position of point C using that information. We can start by using the law of sines, which again, I'll just remind you, is going to have something like the length of one side of the triangle divided by the angle that's across from it. So in this case, you can look at the length of AB, which is the side here, and it's divided by the angle across from it, which is close to this point C. That angle is going to be pi or 180 degrees minus theta one minus theta two, right? Because the sum of the angles in the triangle is 180 degrees. So if we take 180 and subtract theta one and theta two, that's going to give us this angle here. And we can set that equal then to the length of side AC, which is not known. AC is here. And the angle across from that then is theta two, or the sine of theta two, then in this case with the law of sines. Now, um, if we use point A as the origin of our coordinate system, then we can find the position of point C relative to point A. And that's going to have a combination of an X and a Z um, coordinate. And so XC is going to simply be AC times the sine of theta one. That again, that sine of, or that side of the um, triangle AC is not known, but we can solve, rearrange this equation up here at the top to solve for AC and plug that in to get this kind of more complicated relationship here. And you can do something similar then for ZC and you can then find your position of C as a function of the X and Z coordinates. Um, as shown here. In order to do strain measurements using this method, essentially what you have to do is go back and reoccupy or revisit these monuments. And in this case, A and B would be monuments. You'd be going to those points and you would calculate the position of C at several different times. And if you do it very accurately, you can begin to 
C, how the position of point C changes with respect to A and B through time. And typically the distances you're looking at here could be tens or uh, maybe even 50 kilometers between these different sites. Now, if you do this kind of calculation, one thing that's helpful is to actually have a network of triangles because if you could imagine, if you know the positions of some of these points um, with a bit of accuracy, going and making multiple measurements of the position of a given point, for instance C, from different locations will give you a more accurate position of that unknown point. Okay, so that was the kind of overview of historical strain measurements and the method that was used or one of the methods that was used and that is uh, triangulation. There are several others described in the geodynamics textbook. Now it's time for you to take a quiz and see what you learned and when we come back we'll be looking at more modern techniques for measuring strain in our last lecture on strain.